Well, it's good to be with you on a Saturday in my Saturday clothes. See, Monday to Friday, I, we have to get this to click, that's the wrong way. Monday to Friday, I'm a business consultant and I wear the consulting uniform. You know, button down shirt, nice pair of pants, the occasional sport coat, but everything changes on Saturdays. When my family and I rent a commercial kitchen and crank out about 100 loaves of bread for a growing number of customers in our town. Our customers pre-order their bread online and pick it up on Saturday afternoons in a gourmet shop in town. That kind of makes our business model a mashup of your local farmer's market CSA, where you pick up whatever is fresh from the farmer's field each week, and Dell Computers, where you can you know, pre-order and pre-configure a computer online. In our business, I go by the handle, the bread dude. My wife, Gretchen, she's the boss, <laughs> obvious reasons. Our customers, we call them bread fans, and those loaves of bread, they're bundles of joy. <laughs> now, nobody gets rich making handcrafted bread in suburban America. That business model is just flat out busted. You'll never have to worry about seeing me on a stage with Bill Gates, and Warren Buffett trying to figure out how I'm gonna give away my billions. That's never gonna happen. But I love bread. Don't ask me why, you like yoga or football or golf. I like bread. And there's no one in our town, no bakery in our town who makes the kind of handcrafted bread that exposes supermarket bread for the plastic wrapped lie that it is. So about five years ago, I started thinking, we gotta do this bread thing. Both because I love bread and because I wanted to try an entrepreneurial venture that was both for profit and for the common good. So after whopping up a website on a weekend, we launched our doughy adventure. And we've met hundreds of people in our community that we would never have met without a bread connection. We also get to participate in weekly moments of joy that we just love, like when you shape bread. There is nothing like a big, beautiful hunk of dough and the, and the kind of choreography of a crew turning 120 pounds of dough into 100 pounds of deliciousness. We love shaping bread. And then what happens next? See, we, our customers pre-order their bread, so we know before any ingredients hit the bowl about how many loaves we have to make each week, but it's hard to make exactly 102 loaves of bread. So we usually throw a couple extra in the bowl. When we're done baking, we know exactly how many extra we have. That's when we put a message on our Facebook and Twitter feeds, inviting bread fans to text my phone if they wanna pick up an extra. And then we wait, and then this happens. Within minutes, usually we sell out. But my favorite weekly moment of joy is when our bread fans come and pick up their bread in the gourmet shop. They amble back through the store and we chit chat and they taste the samples of the day's bread. And then I give them a fresh loaf of bread and a paper bag peeking out through its little plastic window. It's still warm usually. And many bread fans do something instinctive. They cradle the bread. It's why we call them bundles of joy. You see, we've discovered something, which is that while we started this whole thing for the joy of bread, our joy has been multiplied by bringing joy to others. And that recipe is intoxicating. Now, I've always dreamed about scaling up noonday bread. In my mind's eye, I can see hundreds of bread fans up and down the commuter train line in Chicago, picking up their bread at kiosks, bringing bundles of joy home. I imagine employing hardworking people who need a leg up and helping them with opportunities for ownership and nobility in the work. I imagine going to schools and working with students from the age of 10 through high school, helping them see how everything you learn in school, math, science, social studies, art, everything is useful when you wanna start an entrepreneurial business. I imagine from our profits funding microloans for food entrepreneurs in the developing world so they can lift their families from poverty. 
In my mind's eye, I can see the headlines in the business sections of the Chicago papers describing us as the Tom Shoes of bread, back when Tom Shoes were super cool. And uh, we would be masters of the altruistic world. Five years later, though, my, my defined life, I'm still not baking bread. And my wife, Gretchen, she's not running, she's not running a bread operation. She's a marriage therapist. If we love bread so much, why don't we do it full time? The answer, as it turns out, lies in the math, although maybe not the way you think. See, growing up, I always thought I, I knew, because I was kind of taught subliminally, what it takes to be happy, kind of a recipe, or if you're a fancy schmancy baker, a formula that tells you how things should work. It starts when you're in high school and you pull down great grades, maybe add a few extracurricular uh, activities to round out your resume, and then you apply to the best school you can, and you go to that school, hopefully a school with a badger as a mascot, and you ingratiate yourself to some professors. They write re great recommendations to grad school or to a hot company where you go start your career and you climb and you climb and you climb, and pretty soon, pretty soon you can move out of that apartment to the starter house, to the mid-size house, to the house where your taxes are more than your parents would ever have thought about paying on a mortgage. And if you're really lucky, you're in the C-suite. You've hit the top. You're a partner in a firm. You're a tenured professor at a prestigious university. You've arrived. This is the formula I think I was taught. And summarized, it looks something like this. Success plus being a decent person is happiness. In my consulting work, I actually have spent for the last 25 years a lot of time in these rooms, the C-suite. And I've been struck, I mean, I actually thought that decent people at the top, especially decent people from happy places like Wisconsin or Minnesota, would not just be happy, they'd be deliriously happy. I thought the C-suite would be exploding with contentment and joy. As it turns out, not so much. I've been struck over 25 years by how many of my clients are not just unhappy, they're profoundly unhappy. And you kind of think to yourself, how can that be? When you get to that spot, you know, you're smart, you're successful, you should be happy. But in reality, for many of them, the misery has just begun. And they look around, they go, huh, yeah, I'm smart and my colleagues are smart, but even the smart ones, maybe especially the smart ones, are not just unhappy, but they're scared. And fear makes smart people stupid. And worse yet, fear makes decent people mean. So you should think, well, what, what could possibly make somebody who ascends to a very high altitude be at all nervous? Well, maybe that. You know what this means? This means we have to think differently about what it is to be happy at work. We have to re-examine the math. I was lucky. I grew up in the shadow of somebody who knew older and deeper math. My dad taught me a different way of looking at things. He got the math right. My dad's story is actually an American dream story. He was born into abject poverty, the youngest of 10 children in the 1930s. He's in a snappy set of clothes here, but I just need to tell you that I know for a fact he figured out at the age of six that his family was too poor to buy him clothes, and he probably bought this set of clothes and every set of clothes the rest of his life. He went on to become a doctor and could have done many visible things with his medical career, but instead he decided to serve the unseen and marginalized. So he started clinics for rural African Americans in the segregated South in the 1950s. He ran medical facilities for the mentally handicapped in New York, and toward the end of his career, he started a teaching practice for young doctors who were trying to learn to work with the elderly, another unseen population in our world, in nursing homes. None of these populations were sexy or wealthy or powerful 
which is exactly why my dad wanted to serve him. He knew there was a different way of getting the good life. He got the math right. He never exactly said it this way, but this is the equation I think my dad lived by. Being who you're created to be plus contentment equals success. Now notice, to make that math work, we flipped a few things around from the one that I learned as a kid. Uh, we said that instead of success being a necessary ingredient for a happy, good life, it's something that's much more organic and comes from something that's true to who we are, who we're created to be. And I don't know about you, you may, be, may have been created to be the next Lady Gaga or the next uh, Mark Zuckerberg or Barack Obama. I kind of doubt it. I wasn't. But whoever you're created to be, the third part of this equation is you're going to have to work super hard to be contented because our world has made discontent a virtue. Most of us spend our lives, even when we have a super good, which most of us in this room really do, looking over our shoulders and thinking, could it be even better? Not my dad. My dad knew that the key to contentment was living who he was, who he was created to be. And I was probably taught that and subliminally picked that up as a kid. But it's easy for me to forget. And I need to be reminded of things easily lost, things easily forgotten. Maybe you do too, which makes me want to ask you, are you getting the math right? Now, this brings me back to bread. If you know me well enough, you'll find out that everything brings, bring, comes back to bread if you hang around long enough. About a year ago, Gretchen and I thought, maybe we should think about scaling this thing up. Let's go big with the bread thing. So we ran the numbers the way you should run the numbers. And of course, there was the usual panic of ovens and mixers and staff and how much money that costs. But there were some uncomfortable truths that we had to face that went beyond just financial numbers. They went to deeper math. Uh, you see, we have two sons, 19 and 15, which means that our tuition in our family unit, our tuition life is going to look something like this over the next seven years. Just say it's going to be ugly. What's the final number? Who the heck knows? But it's going to be ugly. And we realized that, yes, we could quit our bread venture and pour ourselves full time into, I mean, quit our normal jobs and pull ourselves full time into the bread venture and tell our kids, work it out. But we were parents long before we were into the bread. And we want to help launch our kids. So we realized one of us, at least, was going to have to stay doing our normal career to help fund tuition level income. Now, here's some simple math. Uh, as important and meaningful as Gretchen's therapy work is, it takes a lot of unhappy couples at $125 an hour to fund tuition level income. Whereas in my consulting work, I can do that with a reasonable amount of effort and time. So we started thinking to make this happen, we're going to have to redirect most if not all of Gretchen's time from therapy into running a retail bread operation. Now she likes bread, but I'm not sure it's her life calling. So we had one of those moments of irony where we thought this venture that originally was all about helping us get the math right could go horribly wrong. In an attempt to make our business successful through some arbitrary financial measure, and more to the point, to feed my ego, we might nudge Gretchen away from the work that she's called to do, that she was created to do, towards something she, she could do, but she wasn't created to be. Once we saw that and we knew the math, the decision was simple. We would keep our bread operation, our quirky little venture, as a weekend-only business with modest profits and plenty of joy. Now, I say it was simple. Don't think for a second it was easy. Equation one dreams die hard, especially when they're built on lies that we sometimes accept as truths. Let me give you a couple. 
one of my favorites is do what you love and the money will follow. Which if it were true would mean I could make a full-time living eating pizza and watching soccer. Which if any of you want to offer me the job, I'm in right now. Second lie that I love is that work shouldn't just be work or a career. It should be your everything, like some kind of soulmate. Like work is your lover in a romance novel about work. Sometimes work is just work. Or one I alluded to earlier, which is that contentment is for losers. That somehow, if you're contented, you're a slacker. You just don't have the guts to do something big. Don't get me wrong. There are plenty of things that we should be discontented about in our world. But whether or not I get the corner office or I have the most followers on Twitter shouldn't be one of them. So maybe, uh, maybe you're facing a turning point right now. And I just want to ask you a question as you think about the turning point you might be facing. Are you really looking at what you're created to be? Or as you make your decision about that turning point, are you chasing some arbitrary level of success? Are you making a decision based on where you can contribute from your best to the world? Or is it really that you're just not very happy with your current circumstances? Or maybe you're just cruising along in everyday life. That's a great time to live equation two. An equation two person holds her life very carefully. She knows, she knows, that even if her impact isn't very visible, that like yeast in a batch of dough, that transforms it from a sticky, messy goo into a beautiful creation that creates benefit for, for everyone and everything around it, her life can be that way too. She knows in the words of a wise author how to put her good where it will do the most good. So. Trade in the lies that you have to get more, be more, be more visible to have a good life. Abandon your envy of your so-called friend and their recent award or their upcoming trip to the Caribbean. Trade all that in for the truth that wealth and fame and power are nice but are not ultimately what defines a good life. Do it now, especially if you're not facing a crossroads. Because when that happens, how well you've learned the math, how deeply it's in your person will make all the difference. And in the end, it's all about getting the math right. Thank you.